about what life's like out in the Sargasso Sea. And today I want to talk a little bit about some of the ecological perspectives within the Sargasso Sea and the community. I won't get sidetracked by lionfish and lobsters, although they're very important elements in Bermuda. What I want to try to understand, help you understand, is, is looking at the real extensive scales by which when we think about the Sargasso Sea, that are, you really have to keep that perspective, looking at uh, the very vastness of the system and remembering we've got both spatial and temporal dimensions that are very important when you look at some of the biology of the animals, to some extent the plants that we have here. So you think about this um, large basin of the western eastern Atlantic, they're connected together. The Sargasso Sea is an element that knits those communities together. But that's you know, several thousand kilometers in spatial scale. And we have to imagine that many animals today, we're learning, I'll give you some examples later on, are capable of exploiting the resources in the ocean at that scale, much beyond our imagination until we were able to track them in, in real time. And recognize that this plant is circulating throughout the sargassum, even though it's not uh, an individual clump, may not live that long, it's going to fragment, because it's only a method of reproduction. So at a genetic level, there should be some level of homogeneity in there, although I hope to read a poster today that's going to tell me something different about that. But there's a, a, a largest here, which is very difficult to comprehend and very difficult uh, to work at. And then you can shift from that large space field down to this individual level of a clump, where so much light is packed into just one uh, lump of this weed. There's just so many different uh, invertebrates and, and microscopic plants attached to it. Many of these animals are going to be just stuck on that one clump for its entire life cycle. It's not going to go anywhere. So there's this difference in scales. It's, it's quite remarkable. We also have to think about the temporal scale of the animals that are in the Sargasso Sea and recognizing that some animals are going to be utilizing the resources of the Sargasso Sea for some part of its life cycle and maybe over many decades of its life if you look at long-lived animals such as cetaceans and sharks. Um, and that uh, this activity is also going to be ex uh, determined in the vertical element in terms of the mass migration that happens every night as um, animals migrate up from the, the interior of the ocean to the surface waters to take advantage of feeding resources there. So it's really important to keep in mind that as we try to understand this system, it's at a scale which is very difficult for us to gather enough information to really truly understand all the nature of dimensions that exist for the animals that are using its resources. So the simplest question is, you know, where is this sargassum plant that so many animals become intimately associated by living on it for its whole, whole life or being attracted to sargassum to find food resources as it progresses through various stages of its life. So we look at uh, maps of where sargassum is, and it's still not showing you very much of the entire sargassum sea. We look at early distributions uh, mapped by Carr and, and look at the data from the early uh, phase of exploration by the SEA, Alan Stoner's work, uh, to slightly expand the, the scope of measurement here. These uh, come from the, the, the uh, illustrations from Butler's, Morrison Butler's paper. And we can go forward a little bit more in time and look at uh, the intense uh, uh, nature of the SEA data set that plots out sargassum uh, in, in, uh, in different seasons. Um, but the maps are still limited. You know, we really don't much, know much more about what sargassum is doing as we go all the way out here into the eastern Atlantic. So we have a pretty good picture. Thanks very much for the great effort that SEA has done over time to tell us a lot more about the distribution here. But we still very limited in our understanding of what sargassum is and where it is. Uh, and therefore, what other animals might be using it, because we just don't have that information. This may change uh, going forward as we begin to use uh, satellite oceanography to try to give us more information about the distribution. This is for me to cut down here. Scale is not evident here, but there are algorithms that graduate students and faculty are using uh, to try to determine what we can learn about the distribution of this very distinctive, highly pigmented plant in the ocean. But it's aggregating and disaggregating over time. And so it's the signal's there for a period of time, but if your satellite's on the other side of the planet, you're not going to capture it. So can we uh, gather a data set over time that's going to give us a better spatial map of, of, uh, of, of these plants? And also integrating that with the physical ocean oceanographic uh, and climatological features, which are, uh, occur to just sort of determine whether this material is uh, put into long windrows or aggregated into into large mats, and those uh, characteristic patterns of spatial aggregation or disaggregation really are very important for how animals that are looking for something in the sargassum community are going to find it and detect it and utilize it in some way. So I just want to go back to this idea of, of, of animals and their use of the sargassum uh, community in different ways and sort of understand that uh, we have animals that will cover vast distances, migratory animals, seabirds, sharks, whales, 
go fish, they're going to traverse you know, thousands of kilometers in relatively short periods of time to find resources that ne they need there. We, we understand a fair bit about the, these mass migrations of, of eels coming from both Europe and uh, North America uh, into the Sargasso Sea, strictly to, to spawn and release their but the cephalae larvae that will drift around and eventually make their way back to hopefully healthy rivers uh, where they can continue their life as eels. They're a very highly valuable resource, uh, particularly in, in Europe. I'm not diminishing the North Americans' interest in eels, but the European community is very concerned about it and they're very interested. They spent quite a bit of money trying to study more about what are these eels doing? What do they need? Where are they going to go in order to hopefully have a resource that they can use uh, back in their nation states? We look at migratory seabirds that are moving in both uh, within the northern hemisphere, but also animals that migrate up from the southern hemisphere to use the Sargasso Sea. Uh, there's a, a, a long list of, of animals. We have two particular species, the, the long tail uh, and also the endemic Bermuda cahau, a storm petrel, that uh, breed in Bermuda. Uh, the cahau only breeds in Bermuda. Uh, the long tail also breeds in the Caribbean. But they migrate in on a seasonal basis to, to carry out their breeding activity. Uh, the long tails are just starting right now, the cahows are finished. The long tails will, from what we understand, spend a fair bit of time up feeding around Bermuda. The cahow doesn't seem to do that. It, while it's breeding in Bermuda, it's actually making, uh, on a nightly journey, journey of several hundred uh, kilometers north to the Gulf Stream to actually forage, because there's a bigger payoff for those birds foraging with more, more highly aggregated animals for it to feed on. <laughs> there's a lot more I don't know about seabirds. I was on a cruise recently on the Sea Dragon. We found 12 species of seabirds when we were out there for just six days. I was really familiar with only three of those, the greater your water, pictured above, and also the, the, the tropic bird. This was only the third record of the red tropic tropical birds. A more tropical species tends not to come up, come up to me, but we were out there and we saw one. So it's obviously using those resources in the Sargasso Sea south of Bermuda on a more regular basis, looking at the south polar skua, moving northwards to escape the, the winter of Antarctica at this time of year. So there's a lot more going on that we have to learn about uh, these patterns of distribution of these migratory animals and understand what they're doing there. Uh, we can also look at pelagic fishes. I'll show you a graphic in a minute that looks at uh, the migratory patterns of tunas. There's many other species we have not have got very detailed information about. We have much to learn there. We know a fair bit about some uh, cetaceans, uh, mostly because the migratory humpback whales are passing Bermuda uh, fairly consistently every winter. Uh, we have a, a much larger program that's been growing over the last few years to to identify the animals. We've taken our catalog from about 150 known animals back in 2005 to 880 animals that we've identified just in the last uh, six or seven years. Still much more we have to uncover. And in general, we have to point out that you know, all of our uh, Atlantic sea turtles spend time in the Sargasso as juveniles before hopping off at about this size, either into Bermuda's uh, coastal environment to uh, take up, in the case of the green turtle, uh, life in, the, in our seagrass beds and also into uh, anywhere in the Caribbean basin, as well as back into the Mediterranean. So many different species feed into, this, into the Sargasso Sea to be able to find resources at some stage in its life. But we have so much more to understand about patterns of movement, and especially the feeding relationships. So just to emphasize this point, this is some tag data of, of migratory tunas. Uh, the western breeding of bluefin tuna and the eastern breeding of bluefin tuna. And you can see uh, from these dots, which is over uh, one year's data, uh, that they are penetrating and using both for both of the populations uh, the resources of the Sargasso Sea. And here's just an insert of just uh, one fish's data over a course of a year. Each color is just one month of data. So it's spending, you know, on average, two months of its time just surfing around Bermuda, finding some resources. I don't know what they're eating. I don't know what their diet consists of, I suspect. Large bluefin tuna are probably eating other smaller tunas, but just knowing that temporal pattern is important and understanding the spatial pattern for these animals across here means that the resources in the Sargasso Sea are relevant for that particular species at that particular time. And if we can gather more data and <laughs> it accumulates, we, we get a bigger picture. We've recently collected uh, tag data from tiger sharks. We've tagged off Bermuda. They're showing pan Atlantic patterns of movement on a temporal one annual basis. Uh, we've been tagging our, uh, our endemic seabird, the Cahau. We find that when they leave Bermuda, they don't really spend any time in the Sargasso Sea. They move up to the west coast of Ireland, off the Azores. Uh, we're just this summer, we're hoping to get back some uh, data uh, loggers from our long tails to find out just where they are foraging on a daily basis. On this cruise that I was on, we were 200 miles south of Bermuda, and there was a, ostensibly a Bermuda long tail. That was my assumption, because Bermuda's the nearest landmass. But these data loggers will give us that window of, of information, uh, time, information about what these animals are actually doing out there. 
Other sources of information about the value of, of activity in this study, as seen, is derived from fishery statistics. These are looking at uh, fisheries data. This is the, the bottom of a two panel uh, a graphic that I stole from a, a Virginia a master's student. Uh, looking at fisheries information, they tell you there's stuff out there people find valuable. Looking at when the U.S. entered the yellowfin tuna in the Atlantic, and this is box five, the, the latitude and longitude that we sort of consider the sargasso. So you look at the levels of extraction, and it sort of cuts off right here. If you looked at the top panel that shows you the caps per unit effort, it does this. So as they keep investing more fishing gear, fishing effort, the returns weren't there. I'm sure there are lots of yellowfin tuna out there. We catch them regularly in Bermuda, and our goal in the long, long run, of course, is to have a healthy ocean where we can continue to catch fish at some sustainable level. But you know, this, this, for this particular species and for other large commercially extracted species, they show us that the Sargasso Sea has been and hopefully will have a future as a place for uh, large pelagic fishes to uh, be successful in moving around in there. Uh, but that's just catching them, not really knowing much about their biology, but I'll get back to that in a minute. Now, we can go from that large scale of, of large migratory animals moving around down to this intimate scale of life within the Sargasso community, many hundreds of species, pretty well described, pretty well understood from the collections made here, made by scientists earlier in the 20th century to know who's living in there. Um, we understand that there are animals that are attached here. They're primarily, in many cases, hydroids filter feeding, extracting planktonic nutrient resources, and to be useful as they sweep those nutrients into sustaining the growth of Sargasso in a relatively um, oligotrophic situation we find in the surface waters of the Sargasso Sea. So we have some idea of what's living in here, but it really hasn't had a whole lot of attention. And some of the, something's not working here. There's another, you're trying to get to the next slide? Trying to get to the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> There's another Okay, technology. <laughs> okay, so, so, <laughs> so we, is that the right one? Or there was one before that. Okay, there we go. We seem to be working. So from that aggregate information about the diversity of invertebrates primarily and, and the fishes that are often associated with it, we can build a, a model of who eats who uh, in the Sargasso Sea. A lot of this is derived uh, by the work by Morris and Butler to look at the transfer of hydrocarbons because this early study of the Sargasso Sea was really driven by the concern about um, hydrocarbons aggregating as tar lumps uh, back in the, in the 70s. We managed to solve that problem, but by tracing the, the uh, hydrocarbons through the food web, we get some idea of who is eating who as well as a dietary analysis. So we have a model of what, what this community of, of life in there is, and all these animals in here, this in here, various shrimps and crabs, are going to be opportunities for fishes to uh, recruit in there. Uh, while we have endemic fishes such as uh, histrio, the sargassum fish, and the sargassum pipefish, the napus, many other fishes come in there as larvae begin to develop, using the sargassum as a, as a nursery habitat uh, is very critical for that. So we have a model of what's going on here, but we still have a lot of questions, and particularly since uh, the effort to study the sargassum has really sort of diminished. We really don't know a lot about the sargassum communities in terms of are they the same around Bermuda? Are they the same 700 kilometers to the southeast? Where they lie closer to the Gulf Stream, north of Bermuda, and south of Bermuda? We don't have a really good spatial map of what these communities look like. And particularly, we want to know have they changed over time from the intense work done in the 70s? While SEA has continued to accumulate a good library of information, uh, we, we want to use that and begin to ask other questions. We look at calcifying organisms that make up a significant part of the sargassum community, our barnacles, our uh, bryozoans in particular, any of the crustaceans. They're living in a, going to live in a more acidic ocean. What's their fate going to be uh, living under these changed conditions? So we can look at the historic data that we, we have here, uh, and a great bulk of it has come from SEA in different ways. But we also have to remember that that, that insight really comes from relatively limited spatial and temporal dimensions. We showed you the cruise tracks, which are nicely repeated because it's very good to come to Bermuda and then leave to and from Bermuda if they get south or come north from there. Um, but that's done over a relatively small period of time, over a month or two period. So we need to try to expand that. But even within that data set, we begin to see there are differences within the sargassum community at a spatial scale. We don't really know the temporal scale at all yet. And that's telling us that things are not uniform. They're not identical. The communities don't work that way. So in that, when you understand that that uh, variation in community structure may, uh, may exist, then you have to realize that that model we have about who's eating who 
may not always be applicable. So we can look at this information that comes out of uh, Stoner and Mooney's paper, looking at some of the distributions of stations occupied closer to the Gulf Stream, west of Bermuda, versus ones that are around Bermuda, slightly south and north of us. And here's an example of the, the top of that pyramid, the, uh, the Sargasso Blue uh, swimming craft, Fortuna Sei, quite abundant in all the stations over here in the Gulf Stream, completely absent from all these stations. Look at this uh, camera amplified, Sinanthophoe, very common in the Sargasso Sea stations, completely absent over here. So that lack of homogeneity means that you have to uh, not fall into the assumption that all these systems are going to work exactly the same way, whether you add or subtract different species over time, what are the outcomes going to be? Maybe this is just so limited because of the space and time in which it was sampled that on the broader scope of movement and pattern, that really does all average out. But you wouldn't want to hold that assumption uh, too rigidly until you had a chance to really look at it more closely. The other thing I wanted to bring to everybody's attention is to recognize that the Sargassum Sea is just at the surface, and there's all this life below it, which is very active and very dynamic, particularly with this uh, nightly migration of, of zooplankton and all the things that are chasing the zooplankton up into the surface waters. And Bermuda's great advantage is that you know, we're out in the middle of it, and all, from time to time, lots of stuff dies and washes up on our shore. So we keep finding an examples of animals without uh, having to do a whole lot of effort except to be aware of it. And living in Bermuda, most people are quite curious about things. So when a fisherman finds this gigantic deep water squid that I haven't identified, and that eyeball is about that big, you know, they get to bring it to me. They get to figure out, hey, here's a denizen in the deep. What's it doing? What's it been feeding on? Likewise with these other fish that we have here. Remarkable diversity of life in the inner ocean that we still really don't have a very complete picture about because it's so difficult to get out there on a regular basis to really study and understand it. Other examples of flotsam and jetsam I find on the reef, this roughly up here, probably more associated with the seamount than a, as a flagged animal. I don't know much about grommets. We get quite a few of these uh, large homostrepes, uh, squids, regularly uh, stranding in the meter that, that are probably to look at. So there's a lot more life in the interior of the ocean, and what are its, are its connections to uh, the surface waters in terms of some of the things we, that we are concerned about. Here's an example of another find. This is a, a set of, of bictophans, these are lantern fishes that vertically migrate every day. I found these along one beach one morning, and uh, these animals have migrated up to feed on particles. We're really concerned about uh, particles of plastic in the ocean. What is a burden for these animals in terms of, of, of taking on those plastics? I uh, haven't had time to dissect all these. Any volunteers want to come and dissect all these fish guts? They're not very big animals. So there's just much more going on in the Sargassum Sea than what's obvious when you, when you fly into Bermuda or you're sailing along. You can see uh, these rafts of seaweeds. There's the, the, the opportunities for life to, to use the resource in the, in the Sargassum Sea are, are quite, uh, quite varied in dimension. It's important to keep that in mind. Just thinking about this life in the deep ocean, this is a graphic from Sutton that looks at the, the abundance of, of deep sea fishes that are going to be either you know, in relatively shallow waters, they have the uh, pelagic species versus uh, deeper species. Here's Cyclophony brown eye, that's, that's the champion so in terms of its frequency of abundance in there. Again, probably a, a particle feeding predator. Uh, what do we know about the impact of, say, pelagic plastics? plastics or contaminants on this particular fish species, or indeed the entire interior uh, population of fishes. Much more to be learned there. So I just want to finish up now to talk a little bit about some of the efforts that we're doing in Bermuda with respect to conservation in the Sargasso Sea. And we are sort of involved in two sort of slightly intermeshed but slightly out of sync efforts. And one is the work with the uh, Sargasso Sea Alliance, which is a privately funded uh, group uh, that are, has a, an office in, in London, uh, led by Dr. David Freestone, who's a, an environmental lawyer. And the idea is to try to build a, a broad alliance to set aside parts of the Sargasso Sea um, as a marine protected area. And the track they're taking is really to try to engage intergovernmental inter cooperation through the offices and various agencies of the UN to be able to build up a sense of, well, we could work together, together to do this. But I think it'll fall into many of the cases that, that Tundi has, has highlighted before, just saying that, that the place is the one thing you have to worry about um, is not going to be sufficient. And in many cases, it's the biology that should drive what that, that, what that thing looks like. Do you happen to know that all the tiger sharks are going to be spawning in Bermuda? Well, you want to make that the place that's a core area that you have to look at. If you don't know much about what's going on out here because no one's actually been out there to sample, you should probably take some time to go and look for some interesting biology before you start drawing lines and making agreements with what you can or can't do in different places. This will be a longer term process, but we seem to be building some momentum. We've had some uh, pretty positive interactions at the UN level to identify the Sargasso Sea as an 
areas of special biological significance, that's a, a, a big step forward. Another effort a bit closer to home is working with the, the Pew Global Ocean Legacy Group to look at Bermuda's exclusive economic zone, which extends 200 nautical miles in all directions, that sort of inner circle around there, and try to look at setting aside some of that area as a marine protected area. And uh, it's been getting a lot of press. We have an alliance of our NGOs to working towards uh, trying to get the word out that there would be some value. And just about two weeks ago, we sat down for the first time between our commercial fishermen who spend time offshore, usually going after billfish or tuna. We have one long line fishing, fisherman in Bermuda, the NGO groups, and the government. And it was our first meeting to try to figure out what's going on. It was a really interesting meeting because for the last two years, the NGO groups have been saying, we need protected areas. Get out there and protect it. And the fishermen said, well, it already is protected. We've got an exclusive economic zone. Nobody can go in there and do anything. And the fishermen said, well, you know, if you draw a line in the, sign, a line, a line in the sign, sand and say, well, we'll protect all the area of water 100 miles to 200 miles, which would be 76% of Bermuda's waters, that would be a big number to protect. But the fishermen's response was, but I'm out there fishing, and I'm following a, a piece of satellite oceanography and television. This is the temperature front where I'm most likely to find my fish. And I'm at mile 95, and you're telling me I can't go to mile 100 to catch that fish for the to two days I'm going to be out here? I don't know. There's a lot of interesting ways to, to take a enthusiasm for protection, but make it work at the level that's going to uh, allow for sustainable extraction. So we hope to move forward with that in a positive way. But it's slow going, but I'm optimistic we'll get there. We do a fair bit of work uh, stimulated by the arrival of the Sea Dragon and the Five Gyres Group to look at uh, marine to marine, marine plastic to reef specifically. This is a picture of our very first sample, 248 grams of plastic junk uh, that was just along 25 meters of the high tide on Bermuda. And this is some of our data <coughs> since that time. There's quite a lot of variance depending on beach. Some beaches are better traps at collecting plastic debris, others are around five or 10, but it's never zero. Right? Every student group I take out there, there's always something. And you can say, oh, where's this piece of, piece of plastic? And that gets their attention in a hurry. Uh, we hope to continue to uh, work with the Sea Dragon and especially, especially SEA to think about more about uh, plastic. The plastic data that SEA has collected over the last few years is really quite remarkable. Well, the last few decades, I should say, not years. And really provides a great context for what we're doing. Uh, we'd like to use Sea Dragon, if we can raise the funds, to go further east of Bermuda, that area that doesn't get much attention, to see what we can find out there. And we have some partners that are trying to uh, continue to work on that. I would just like to, to co conclude by saying that we, we know a lot about the Sargassum Sea in many ways. We know a lot about certain sp species, but there's a lot of other species that we really have much more work to do. And I think we have to get the biology straight if we're going to be effective in trying to come up with the best conservation strategies. It's no good saying we're going to protect something, there's nothing going on there because you lack the information to know where uh, significant biological uh, events occur in terms of migration, reproductive activity. And I hope that we can be effective in our conservation efforts to try to um, uh, work with uh, any partners uh, to try to do a better job of keeping some of the threats down. But the threats aren't going to go away at the plastic. It's just it's going to be a long-term problem. Thank you very much.